Here's something that Joe Biden has been right about from the very beginning. The defining struggle of our time is autocracy versus democracy. We need to be on the side of democracy, the United States of America. That's what we stand for at home and abroad. Donald Trump doesn't. And the fact that the party that prides itself on freedom, part of a robust international foreign policy tradition during the Cold War, from Eisenhower through Reagan, would go neo-isolationist at the drop of a hat and effectively enable and rationalize and justify Vladimir Putin, that is a civic sin of the first order. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. We're bringing back our spirit partner, John Avalon, who's left the commentariat and officially announced last week that he's running for Congress as a Democrat in New York's first congressional district. Welcome back, brother, and uh, congrats getting in the arena. Thanks, man. Yeah, it feels good. I, uh, you know, it's obviously a, a big leap, but if not now, when? Uh, this is the, the, it's, it's the most urgent time as in the history of, in our lifetimes. And, uh, and I just, I just, didn't feel good about just offering opinions. Uh, well, could you do yeah. me a favor? Could you just do me job. one favor, though? I mean, we're going to get to your campaign, and I want to hear a little yeah. bit more about the Avalon yeah, story. Totally. But could you just indulge me and be a pundit for one question? Could we do one punditry sure. question at the top? Sure. Just bring your old, see if, see if those old muscles are still working uh, one week into the campaign? Yeah, yeah. All right. So last night, we had a Michigan primary. There's a, mm-hmm. there's a lot of consternation out there because mm-hmm. 13% of the Democrats voted un, uncommitted in Michigan. I'd point out that in 2016, John Kasich did about 10 points better than that uh, in his run against Donald Trump. And uh, I don't remember any profiles or obsessions or bedwetting about the Hoover, Miller, Rhino vote and you know what it means for us, uh, the centrists who like consensus. But uh, there's a lot of concern about the kind of progressive vote that, that voted uncommitted yesterday. So I'm, I'm curious how you handicap what we saw in Michigan last night. You know, I, 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 uh, I think you're, you're right that this is about an expectation game, not about reality. And when you impose perspective on our political debates, sometimes the outrage Olympics uh, are, are diminished. Uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, sites, in addition to the Bulwark, um, we're, we're, we're fans in, in, in our house, uh, appreciate that. household. Um, is uh, 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 Tegan Goddard's Political Wire. Yeah, I've, I've read it for years. Great digest. And he, he did a really useful analysis, basically making the case that I think when Obama ran for reelect, the, the you know, un, undecided number was essentially the same. Yeah. So, um, it, it, you know, this is about gaming expectations and the media falling for it. And, and, and the, you know, the Biden administration probably not pushing back, you know, or campaign pushing back effectively enough on it. But you're right. You know, we, we, it's a totally artificial benchmark. So you impose from perspective and everyone takes a deep breath or should. Okay. So you're taking a deep breath. No panic right now about the, about the, no, uh, I mean, especially when you start dealing with like the, you know, Oh, how will, uh, how will positions on war and peace impact the domestic election? That seems like the worst kind of hang ringing. You do what's right. And that's usually good politics. As yeah. John McCain used to say. Um, John McCain had some good wisdom. Okay, so I, I want to I want to get into like the details of the campaign. We're nerds, so I kind of want to nerd out on the yeah, district man. and your opponent. But I, you know, I was thinking about this interview, and I was like, you know, for me, John Avalon kind of like emerged out of whole cloth as a centrist commentator. You know, sometime in the mid aughts, like, I, and I don't, you know, we've got to hang out a bunch, which I, which I uh, yeah, have always enjoyed, but like, I don't know your, like, I don't really know your origin story. So I would love, to, I kind of want to just go do a little bit before we get into the present day of going back and like, what was, what was the political spark for you? You know, talk, talk to me about young John. Hmm. I, I, I really, uh, I, I love the origin story. I feel like, uh, this is like a deep cut Marvel uh, yeah. Segue. Yeah, Wolverine. Um, we're doing so Wolverine, John Avalon. We're doing Wolverine. I dig that. I was a big Wolverine fan once upon a time. Um, so, uh, look, I, I think in terms of just what got me excited about politics was uh, being excited about American history. And that came disproportionately from my grandparents. Um, my, grand- I'm the, my grandparents were immigrants. Uh, my grandfather was born in Argentina, a Greek family, came through Ellis Island at the age of three, served in World War II. Um, uh, by their grandfather's family was wiped out in the Spanish influenza epidemic and uh, uh, came here uh, on a ship uh, stowaway and then was, was adopted by, by a family. Um, wow. And I think immigrant families, uh, especially when they achieve the American dream, have a deep appreciation 
for America that they communicate. Like there's a sense if you're the grandson of immigrants that you have an obligation to the opportunities they provided as a family, but also as a country. Like it, you know, so my, 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 my grandfather in Youngstown, Ohio served in World War II. You know, we always talk about Abraham Lincoln and Harry Truman and, and, and these people were incredibly real and relevant to his life. Um, he even had a copy of the Dewey Deeds uh, defeats Truman uh, 48 newspaper in, in the basement. And, um, that was hugely, hugely formative for me. And so I was one of those kids who would love reading like books about Abraham Lincoln or, you know, just meet the presidents, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, all that stuff. Yeah. And I think that translates pretty quickly to those little you know, blue, kind of, those little blue cover biography books. Was that you in second grade? I guess I, I you know, I, I think they had a lion on the spot. Yeah, the lion. Uh, okay. uh, but, um, but, but they were, they were great. And, and they were sort of, you know, one of the things I'm, you know, politics is history in the present tense. That's one of my sort of core beliefs and overly quoted aphorisms. Um, so it gives us a chance to interact with that. But I also think there's a certain, especially in America, you know, because we're the only nation not founded on a tribal identity, but on an idea, uh, that kind of civic firmament, the making old stories new again, is really important. It's why I'm passionate about applied history. It's why, you know, in addition to being a columnist and editor and you know, analyst anchor, uh, you know, I write history books. I love that. And, right. and it's, it's applied history, right? It's, it's, a, it's a different take. It's a different cut. Washington's farewell address was the subject of one. Lincoln's plan for how you win a peace after winning uh, the war, but also using the second inaugural as a text. It's about useful wisdom. And it's about, uh, it's about revive, making those old stories new again, because America really depends on that. And, and of course, that imposes perspective on our politics. You realize the times that we've been fragmented, and it looks like the, the, you know, our country's falling apart. Um, the forces that lead to that fragmentation are similar. Yeah. So you can impose some clarity on the political choices. Like, you know, uh, you know it helps if you hear the echo. You know, if you hear the echo of, of, of uh, um, uh, you know, you know, segregationist arguments, then, you know, you're probably on the wrong side of things. You know, <laughs> uh, you're just... You're yeah. just um, and uh, but also the kind of it is possible to offer unifying leadership in divided times, but that requires, a, a, you know, in Lincoln's case, a reconciling leader. And if you look back to the founding fathers principles, you know, Washington spent most of his farewell address warning about hyper partisanship and polarization, what they called faction. But we would recognize, yeah. uh, you know, he says it, it, it inflames uh, ill founded jealousies and false, false alarms leads occasionally to riot and insurrection. Um, this is hugely relevant, yeah. wise stuff. And that's why in most of my writing as a columnist and, and, and as a commentator and, and as a you know, historian, uh, it's all different takes on the same issue that I know we're all in common cause. The, t- warning about the dangers of hyperpartisanship and polarization and then hopefully proposing solutions for how we can, uh, h- how we can you know, reunite as a nation uh, because democracy depends on it. And, and that's one of the things I love about about what you guys are doing at the Bulwark and, and, and the whole loose coalition, sometimes called like democracy, you know, the pro-democracy and, movement. We're doing it. Yeah, um, man. I, I want to, uh, I, I would, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm rambling. I no, 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 I like this ramble. Really I like this ramble. It's taking me away. I still, I still want to do, uh, I have a few more mm. on origin story questions, but that's okay. Sure, because fine. I want to, I want to yeah, do, because totally. I think that there's a direct line between what you're talking about. And, and, and this was another thing I wanted to get into is this, the threats that you saw, that, that Washington warned about with factionalism, mm-hmm. the, the wisdom of, of the Lincoln second inaugural. Talk to us about how that ties to like your rationale for getting in this race now. And like what, what you see sure. as the, as the, as the reason why you need to actually be in the arena, not on, not on the CNN set. I, as, as much as I loved my job and my colleagues um, and I uh, think CNN does great work. I didn't want to look at my kids and say that I could have done more when it mattered most. Um, I think this is one of those moments in our history. If there's ever moral clarity and moral urgency around an election, it's this time. We've never had a major party nominee campaign on on an authoritarian platform while praising dictators who already tried to destroy democracy on the back of a lie, who not only that is using that election lie as a litmus test for party loyalty and succeeding. That's not sinister. Nothing is. That's not dangerous to our democracy. Nothing is. And so it seems to me that simply, you know, as much as I love doing what I've done, I don't think uh, commentary and opinion is enough if you have an opportunity to do something different. And uh, in this case, uh, you know, the opportunity to flip a seat uh, where we live, 
with a candidate who's embraced, you know, embraced Donald Trump, first term Republican. And 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 I was looking at the field of candidates and I said, you know, this is a chance to to put our ideas in action and do some good in a measurable, meaningful way. And obviously there are real sacrifices. You know, we got a young family, not, not as young as yours, but we got a young family. And um, and so this was a really serious decision, but I didn't want to look back and feel like I could have done more when it mattered most. And I feel like this is an all hands on deck, not a drill moment. And you got to get off the sidelines and roll up your sleeves and, and get in the arena. And it's been hugely invigorating and rewarding. Um, but I understand why, you know, it, 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 it's tough, right? This is, you know, Steve Bannon with his flood the zone with shit stuff has made public service seem indecent and dangerous. Yeah. To people's reputations and their finances and everything else. So what does that do? That's designed to sort of seed the public ground to people who don't mind want walk, you know, wading through shit. And you know, he's winning like that battle on experience. the Republican side, by the way. Look at Mike Gallagher. Like, right. Like as you're getting in, you see the Mike Gallagher's of the world, the Kathy McMorris Rogers. These people are just like, nope, not worth it. Not worth it. I'm leaving. And, and that and, and that's a real loss. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, to, to our country. I mean, you know, so many good Republicans, uh, you know, have been run out of their party or decided to, to abandon ship. And we all know the problems, right? It's, 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 it's the rig system redistricting. It's, it's, it's close partisan primaries. It's, it's a party that has become radicalized and, and requiring lies as a litmus test, you know, it, on the Republican side. So we have one big tent functioning political party in America left. That's the democratic party. And um, we need, there's no substitute for victory. Just got, got to win. But so, yeah, that that's, it, it, it's been, um, it's been fascinating to see it on the other side as well. It's really, it's, 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 uh, it's been fascinating. Yeah. So I want to, I, 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 I want to hear about that because look, before we, get, before we end, we're going to have just a big agreement about the radicalization of the Republican <laughs> party. We're just going to have a heated agreement and about your opponent, Nick Lolota, who's a total MAGA freak. Um, but I'm, I'm current, I'm interested in, in, you know, sort of how you see yourself fitting in the democratic coalition, right? Cause your brand was always, you know, kind of like I, I'm a centrist guy. I want to, it's about political reform. It was about, mm -hmm. you know, um, initially you were part of like kind of no labels 1.0 before the sort of bastardization of no labels we've seen lately. <laughs> yes, um, and so how do you see yourself fitting in the, in the democratic coalition today, uh, particularly New York where it's extremely wide at, you know, you have Jamal Bowman types mm -hmm. who, are, who are very far to the left, uh, you know, kind of DSA, curious if you, uh, almost mm -hmm. and then you have a lot of moderate uh, you know eric adams is the mayor of new york who's like sure. <laughs> a kind of a maga democrat if that's a thing I and mean, the democratic party in new york is unwieldy well, so like where do you see yourself fitting in that world well, first of all, I, I think it's healthy to have big tent political parties yeah. and um in in new york in particular we've always had a sort of a reform wing of the democratic party that i think has been essentially centrist and, and interested in, in strengthening democracy uh and um you know you know, if you look at the, the Senate seat held by Bobby Kennedy and Moynihan and Hillary Clinton, yeah. you see a, a straight line uh, in that regard. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a, a DSA kind of guy and my beliefs are pretty constant. Um, you know, uh, I, I do think we need I think bipartisanship is is, is you know, the MAGA crew clearly believes bipartisanship is the problem. It's actually the solution. Right. And, and that doesn't mean you need to be consistent about your principles uh, and, and values, but but you also need to solve problems and and you know, democracy that requires constructive compromise. So I think this is actually, this is very much about putting those ideas that I've been developing and articulating uh, into action, not only, uh, but but also in terms of, of this campaign. I mean, this is a swing seat. It is a swing district. Um, the lines in New York just got moved again yesterday. So uh, this is a district that, uh, uh, you know, Biden had one narrowly and they just moved the lines to have Trump winning it narrowly. Yeah. What'd you think? Story. What'd you think of that? Let's just, we'll do a little nerdy stuff first. Like the, sure. uh, the, right. the, cause I saw that number yesterday. It looked like it was moving. So your district ends up being kind just, of a narrow Trump district, Trump plus one or two. Is that it, final? Yeah. What'd you think about the, See, that? It, appear, it appears to be final. I would have rather them have the left the lines alone. I've been a very, you know, public critic of, of redistricting, you know, because very often, I mean, as we see in Texas and North Carolina, it, it's done, uh, for naked partisan advantage or some kind of collusion between the two parties, I would have preferred it stayed where it was, which was R plus three. Now it's a little more Republican, but still absolutely winnable and well within the 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 
defines of what makes a swing state to nerd out with a swing district, uh, yeah. uh, especially with the right kind of candidate. But look, our country needs more swing districts, right? Part of the, one of the driving factors that, that's problem in our politics is too many safe seats where people have lifetime employment unless they lose a close partisan primary, which, which makes them vulnerable, frankly, to ideological extortion. Yeah. And that's where you get Republicans, especially doing things like voting, <laughs> voting in a way that doesn't actually reflect what they believe or what they think is good for the country, but they're looking over their shoulder and hoping that someone else votes in a way that'll it'll uh, that'll, that'll reflect you know the national interest and their personal beliefs. That's sick. That's psychotic. So look, more competitive districts, the better. And and if you mean that, then then you know put it into action and let's see let's see if if you know my beliefs that we need to build the broadest possible coalition to defeat Donald Trump defend our democracy and win back the house from his maga minions like Nicolota like we need to do that right we need to reach out to independent voters we need to inspire the democratic base we need to reach out to the reasonable republicans who are left who recognize that Donald Trump is the opposite of you know anything resembling constitutional conservative um, I think we can do that. This is a great testing ground. And I love the idea of putting ideas into action. I think that I feel a certain frustration about simply occupying uh, the, the world of ideas. I love writing books. I love history. I'm going to continue to do it in some capacity, I'm sure. But but the idea of actually getting in the arena and actually putting putting these ideas in action is to me thrilling and to, to do it at a time when it matters most. This isn't a no, this is no ordinary time, as they say. And so let's go. Yeah, so I, I'm with you. How are we doing that? How are you getting the you know soft Republicans? How are you getting people maybe even that voted for Trump but didn't like him last time? How do you get into the load? Is there anything so, you learn from Swazi? So for, yeah, yeah, example? no, no. I think Swazi Swazi uh, gave a lot of, of of really of really good lessons. You know, my first campaign event was at the Huntington uh, Town Democratic Committee, and um, and uh, which now is a little more in, in Swazi's district, but basically it's a joining district, right? Okay. I think Swazi showed um, that you can, uh, if, if you're strong in the center, if you play offense on the issues, right? Democrats are always on, on defense. I've heard real frustration on the part of, of voters about this, you know, active Democrats being like, why are we always on defense? Why don't we lean into issues? Why don't we actually play offense? And, you know, and, and if people are concerned about crime and, and immigration, Talk about it. Don't say, oh, that's not really a thing. Talk about their concerns, offer solutions that are consistent with our values. And I think that's exactly right. Um, and and, and I, I do think there's strength in the center. Um, that's just obvious electoral math. Um, and, and, and to me, look, I've got to win a primary first. I want to be real clear. So that's the first test. Sure. And, and the day I got in, not only did the National Republican Congressional Committee attack me immediately first time because they thought they weren't going to have to contest this seat. Now they know they do. Uh, but as a, you know, radical left, you know, liberal hack. Uh, but, you know, one of my opponents uh, in the Democratic primary is trying to attack me as a, you know, shadowy co-founder of no labels, you know, secret Republican. So, you know, welcome to the game. Please. Yeah. Give me give me a break. And exactly. You know, if you're getting you know, if, if that means you're probably doing something right. Um, but most importantly, what I think it does is it, it shakes up the race. And what a lot of Democrats have told me is, is there was this sort of glum sense that the seat wasn't going to be contested, that, that it wasn't being treated as the swing district. It actually is because there hadn't been a candidate who could shake things up and energize the base and try a different kind of politics. And he and, won uh, pretty handily and, uh, last time for people not familiar, right? Like Lolota won. He, he did. The la- in but, 22, but, not in 20, but in 22. In, yeah, in, that. in 22. And, and just to, you know, because this is a political nerd fest, yeah. uh, 22 is not liar election in New York because Lee Zeldin, the former congressman who held this district, was running for governor. Right. Uh, and so, you know, he had high, not only really high name ID, but but I think Democrats said, well, you know, that's his home district. Let's 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 not let's not let's fight elsewhere. Yeah, right. Um, so that created a that, that's that's a one off. I, I believe. Um, I also think the Trump coalition, as you do, has only shrunk since 2020. Um, and so I think even think that benchmark is off now, how the independent voters affect things, particularly nationally, we'll see. But I think New York has a chance to and, and will make a, a very strong statement. But if you, you know, the, the other candidate who, who's in the race right now, um, and I have respect for anyone who gets in the arena, I really do. I have newfound appreciation for it. Believe me, it's not easy. Um, you know, someone who, you know, I voted for and wanted to succeed. Uh, but, you know, she spent $8 million and lost by double digits. You know, there were 20,000 voters who went Biden Zeldin in, in that race. I, there's no reason to rerun that play. No. Try something different, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, if, if, if you've, you know, had a photo of you taken holding a, a, 
defund the police sign, that's not going to go away. It's probably going to get worse, not better. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned the statement. I want to pull it actually up because, you know, I, as, as somebody used to be a practitioner of the trade, you know, I, uh, I, it's interesting to watch the development of, of the kind of language that comes out of the uh, Republican committees these days. Um, mm-hmm. Here's what they said about your announcement. We look forward to litigating this smug liberal hacks past so voters can see just how lefty and the rest of the modern Democratic part, oh, excuse me, modern Democrat at least I didn't say demon rat. Modern Democrat Party have become a very um, just little a little childish, maybe. But um, so yeah. yeah, how do you? How are you going to push? I, I I hear you. You got a primary first, but but okay. You know the point of this is is I, I, is beating Nickel Lode in the end. So like, how do you yes, push back is. against these these freaks? I mean, look, this is one of the things. I think it's going to be real hard to paint me as a scary far left liberal, because uh, I'm not. I mean, we can talk about right. liberalism, not that they actually want to, and the dangers of illiberalism. Yeah. You know? Classical liberalism? Yeah. We yeah, you know, I, I mean, not, not even liberal that. Liberal democracy. I mean, you know, yeah, liberal sure. defense, de- defending de- liberal democracy, diverse liberal democracy at home and abroad. Um, uh, but look, that's that's a cut and paste hit job. And I think people recognize that it's fundamentally false and it feels counterfeit, right? That's the problem with all sort of political boilerplate is people catch on to the fact it's BS sooner or later, but also candidates matter. And and whether you can credibly paint someone as, as that negative stereotype that you depend on to demonize the other side and win elections. Um, I, don't, I don't, that's just not going to work with me, um, you know, uh, because, because of my record and what I've done with my life. I, I just think it's going to be, uh, it's just ain't true. You know, what I really care about is finding a way to reason together off common facts and solve problems. And uh, um, you say, I mean, I've been an an apostle for the vital center, in effect. I mean, I care about this stuff. Um, And I think right now, I mean, I mean, it's very clear uh, that the Democratic Party is continuing that tradition and the Republican Party has utterly abandoned it, unfortunately. Uh, And I think there are some good Republicans who are, 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 are persuadable, absolutely because they feel abandoned by their party because they have been. Yeah. Let's uh, the, talk about then the issues. Like obviously, mm-hmm. I, maybe not obviously, but I presume we all agree. Number one issue here is preserving our democracy and making sure that Donald yeah. Trump isn't president, that Nick Lolota isn't helping him do a soft coup um, come next January. Uh, but what else? Like what are, what are the other top well, things yeah, so like you I think you really clear. care about? Yeah, that's what motivates people like you and me about the, the broader stakes of this election. And I very much buy into this idea yeah. that we need to focus on the stakes of this election. But most folks, that's not necessarily what's going to motivate them. Yeah, right? I think, but, but I think there's a way to square the circle in important ways. I think people have been really disillusioned uh, and frustrated and feel alienated by the failure of our democracy to solve problems for them. And I think that's actually been one of the the, the, the key issues. And also, just affordability and, frankly, the, the long-term squeezing of the middle class. It's not an accident. It's not a coincidence to me that the uh, that the, you know exactly the time the middle of our politics have been hollowed out is in the wake of the middle of our economy being hollowed out and the middle class feeling squeezed for decades. And I think rebuilding the middle class is something that is is an urgent need for the country. It's the kind of thing that can pass the UNUM test and <laughs> focus on on reuniting us. And it's a real need in, in here in Suffolk County. Um, because, look, you know, this is something Democrats can do and Biden's got a good record on, even though it's only beginning to be felt, you know, whether it's the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the bipartisan CHIPS Act, the downstream effect of that uh, is going to be enormously powerful for for rebuilding the middle class in America. And that's a record we need to build on. You talk about affordability. People talk about it all the time. Average cost of the house out here is over six hundred thousand dollars. OK, well, what what are you going to what are you going to do about that? Um, and, and I'll tell you one thing, and this always blows people's minds, but Donald Trump and Republicans raised our taxes. They took away the state and local tax deduction that a lot of New Yorkers depended upon. And they did it out of spite as part of a political stunt. Seriously. And they're not going to, they're not going to reverse it because they're so invested in the red state, blue state divide. So part of my message is Democrats (laughs) are going to, going to, going to, going to bring that deduction back. You know, you're going to get more money back in your pocket. And I think Democrats can do more. I think we should. uh, We've had our first, we found our first disagreement, maybe ever, John Avalon. I live in Louisiana now. So whatever you can, you you don't don't need that deduction up there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm, I'm, you know, all politics is local, but, but actually, you know, I, I, I think it, it does, uh, it it is necessary for a bunch of uh, reasons as much as I love Nola. Um, 
Uh, and, and then I've been, I think, you know, expanding the child tax credit. We did it for one year during COVID. Uh, it cut childhood poverty in half. That's something the Democrats can do that will really help put, you know, money in, in, in Suffolk family pockets. But I think also, like, you look at the way the immigration is a real concern for folks. And it's not just fear mongering from the far right, although that certainly contributed to it. And obviously, I, you know, I think immigrants make us better. It makes better economically, culturally. I'm the grandson of immigrants. One of the greatest moments of my life was giving a, a keynote address at a naturalization ceremony at Mount Vernon two years ago. It was amazing. Um, we need more legal immigration. We need less illegal immigration. We need a comprehensive immigration bill. But what the country just witnessed, and this had something to do with Swazi winning, I think. What the country just witnessed is the, the profile and cynicism and cowardice of demanding uh, a border security bill to pair with Ukraine funding and Israel funding and Taiwan funding for Taiwan. And then abandoning it at Donald Trump's request because they'd rather fear monger and fundraise off the issue than fix it. That to me, that's a firing offense. And Nick LaLota puts out a tweet mocking Oklahoma Senator James Lankford for having shepherded that deal through. A deal that Wall Street Journal said was the best deal that anyone would ever get. And, and, and that, to me, just typifies everything that's wrong and why this cat in particular is far too far right for the district. And by the way, he doesn't even live here. You know, uh, Anthony Garbarino, he has another congressman. He, he literally can't vote for himself in, in, in the election. So it's just ridiculous. But it's, it's, the MAGA, it's the MAGA minion thing. It's the Trump flunky thing that, that pisses me off. Yeah, I'm happy you brought that up because that. because that that deal I was fr I was a little flummoxed. Sometimes you know the Democrats occasionally flummox me, and um, there was a debate <laughs> in California in that Democratic Senate race, and it you know and it's uh, it, well, I guess it's a it's a jungle primary out there. So Garvey's on there too. The Republicans Garvey, it's Schiff, uh, it's Katie Porter, uh, it's Barbara Lee, and they asked them what if they would have supported the deal, and they all said no. Everybody said no. You know, for now, their reasoning is different from Lota, right? Like they're worried that in a Democratic primary out there, that they are gonna that they're gonna come off as too anti-immigrant because of the because mm -hmm. of the immigration issue on there. And I just I looked at that and I was like, that is frustrating. That is the frustrating element of this primary politics everywhere. That people can't just like look at this deal and say, hey, like it's it's not per it's okay to say it's not perfect. I don't agree with every element of it, right? But if you look mm -hmm. at that and you realize that immigration is a problem, you realize Ukraine's a problem. I mean, right? I, I, isn't isn't Guys, this kind of isn't I mean, this like how how shit's supposed to work? <laughs> it is how shit's supposed to work. And by the way, you know, go go back to the Constitutional Convention. If you're venerating the past all the time, go study anything about American history that shows that constructive compromise is the essence of how you get you know deals done in a democracy. This this isn't you know, I mean, and, and look, in that point about imposing history on things. What Republicans are doing by blocking Ukraine aid, I think, you know, it, it, it makes them complicit because they're compounding Putin's invasion of Ukraine, an actual invasion. And, and it, it's, it's sort of, I think it's going to look, you know, sort of never Chamberlain-esque in terms of, of, of its willful naivete. I mean, th this is a serious damn thing. This is about, and, and history is also really clear. You stop aggression. You stand up to bullies. If we don't do this, it's not going to just be Ukraine, right? This is about the trajectory of the 21st century, you know? And, and, and that's why, you know, it's, you know, Ukraine today, Taiwan tomorrow, you stand up to authoritarian aggression. Here's something that Joe Biden has been right about from the very beginning. The defining struggle of our time is autocracy versus democracy. We need to be on the side of democracy, the United States of America. That's what we stand for at home and abroad. Donald Trump doesn't. And the fact that the party that pr prides itself on freedom, that had backed it, you know, on, on backing freedom, that it was, you know, part of a robust international foreign policy tradition during the Cold War from Eisenhower through Reagan and, and, and on. Uh, would go would go neo isolationist at the drop of a hat and effectively enable and rationalize and justify Vladimir Putin. That is a civic sin of the first order, and all those cats can't be allowed to forget it. They are hanging out the brave people of Ukraine and their democracy to die for domestic reasons that they don't even believe. And even worse, if they let it for a vote, it would pass. They're blocking it. Yes, out of fealty to Donald Trump. They're on vacation. What the fuck? They're not yeah, just they're, they're on vacation. Like what what is it's, happening? The, the a, government's going to shut down in a week. 
I mean, but, but we, we've seen that game of chicken over and over again. You know what happens is, is that you get a supermajority of Democrats and a small number of Republicans to ensure that the national interest is felt. But Republicans are absolutely incapable of governing. Basically, not even not just in the national interest, just period governing. They need Democrats to pass anything. This is just a fact. Right? Like this is not yes. an accusation. It's just a no. fact. Like they're running the house and they can't and they can't pass anything because their majority is so small and the, they have a far right faction that refuses to vote for anything. Exactly. But but not you know, Nancy Pelosi had a really small majority as well. And she got yeah. over there were over 300 pieces of bipartisan legislation passed uh, in the first two years of the Biden administration when Nancy Pelosi was speaker and Democrats had a 50 50 split in the Senate. I mean, so, again, this just goes to show the asymmetry, it, it, you know, in, in our politics, that bipartisanship has become a partisan virtue. Democrats believe in and preach and practice bipartisanship. Republicans can't run the government, not at all let alone in the national interest. They're captive to the extremes in their party and they keep rolling over for them yeah. and, and are, 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 you know, nominating them again. The extreme is kind of the median the in the party now. <laughs> it's the other thing. <laughs> you know, you wrote oh, in 2010, man. I've said that I was, I wonder if like you wrote that book in 2010 about wing nuts, how, yeah. yeah, wing nuts. And I was still kind of, at the time I, I gotta just, I gotta confess. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Avalon might be overstating it a little bit. You know, like Avalon, yeah. might, this might be a little hair on fire. Like we're still, do, you know, we still nominated McCain. Romney's around the corner. Like it's not as mm-hmm. bad as he says it is. And I, I think that you had me beat on that one by a couple of years. I, I mean, look, I didn't, I didn't want to be right. And, and my wife uh, would have agreed with you uh, <laughs> at that time. I mean, one of the, our first date was my, my first book, Independent Nation. And one of the really fun things was uh, – uh, not only debating her, but seeing her mark up the copy of my first book with things like <laughs> wrong in the margins and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, Trump has brought us closer than ever. But um, uh, I know political. a little bit about uh, that. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, look, it, and it was a little echoes. I remember when I started doing the extremist beat as a columnist, the Daily Beast, and what came into the book's wing nuts. And the whole point was, it was like, this is happening, pay attention, but also look at the history behind this stuff. So, you know, it was... Uh, you know, if you, if Glenn Beck at the time and look at the churn on this stuff, you know, well, to understand this, you need to understand the John Birch Society. When, when, you know, at the time the Drudge Report had a banner ad across the top after Obama's elected and the country was feeling pretty good with like 70 percent approval at the time um, and, and calling for massive resistance uh, uh, to the election of Barack Obama. And then you're like, oh, wait, you know, that's the slogan of the White Citizens Councils. And and I'm not even sure that was conscious. Right. It, it's like the right. synaptic twitch this sort of lizard brain kind of like make america great it. again was not conscious it's not like donald trump knew the history of that no exactly right but 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 when you america when first. you understand the history it's the it's the old harry truman line the only thing new in the world's the history you don't know and uh uh when when you understand the history and you can listen for you know it's the you know history doesn't repeat but sometimes it rhymes so when you know how to listen for what rhymes that's very clarifying or should be uh um, and um you know, uh, look, it, 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 I, but I never, I, 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 you know, I, we never had an actual, we've had some really bad presidents, God knows. Um, you know, a, a, Andrew Johnson, uh, for probably chief among them. Uh, and but, a few that followed wow. him. <laughs> we had yeah, a bad, but, we had a bad but, run but, there but for I, a while. After but it, what we've, what we've been dealing with in our country has been, um, is without precedent, but there is real, there Grant. should be real moral clarity. Like we, we you know, there should be. Yeah. This, I got a, I got a carve grant out of my, of my late, of, out of my yeah, mid to late 18, 1800s bad presidents list. Okay. I have two other things we, we, we can do. Ulysses <laughs> S. Grant history another time. You're running for Congress. Okay. Two I other things for you. Um, the abortion issue. Yeah. I just, uh, I'm interested in how you kind of see how, how, how you want to talk about that this time mm-hmm. around. I think in New York, I assess that part of the reason why the red wave did hit in in New York and California, maybe not as much as they thought, but why why a lot of Republicans got elected in 22 is because a lot of voters just didn't really think that abortion was a threat there, you know, as in the same way in other states, right? Like it didn't, this issue didn't feel as real yeah, yeah. kind of in these blue parts of the country. And and I thought, boy, I think that's going to be different in 2024 with Mike Johnson as Speaker of the House and Donald Trump coming yes. up as president. So I'm just I'm just wondering how you're thinking about talking about and campaigning on that issue. I, I, I think you're exactly uh, right that it's going to be different in 24. Um, look, you know, defending 
women's reproductive freedom is basic. It's fundamental. It's under threat. We shouldn't be surprised, right? They, they, they've they been telling us, I mean, when people tell you who they are, believe them. And, 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 you know, now we're, now we're fighting over IVF. Come on. Are you kidding me? I mean, you know, uh, other than some weird tossed out, you know, some, some outtake from the handmaid's tale. I mean, if you actually want families, you know, IVF is something you want to encourage, not, not punish, but this is the problem with extreme ideology imposing itself on people's lives. Look, this is something that there, you know, we've seen the eight, the eight states, including deep red states that have pushed back against uh, ballot initiatives uh, to, to, to further restrict abortion. But yet Republicans are still pushing a, na- a national ban. That's clearly at the top of the agenda. And you and I remember when people said, oh, no, 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 no. That's just that, that's never it's never going to happen. But we saw we saw Republican judges lie to the American people and lie to the Senate. Uh, about this and then overturn it the first chance they got. And I think people realize, oh, you're taking away a freedom. And by the way, look, this is the most difficult personal decision that, that a, a woman can make. And and I firmly believe that it should be between a woman, her doctor and her God, not the government. I don't think that's a radical statement. I think that's something that the vast majority of Americans can agree on. And uh, um, and, and And the fact that we are back here fighting this fight is you know, kind of akin to the fact that we're, we're back fighting for liberal democracy. Things people thought were safe aren't because radicals and extremists hijacked the political process. And they're also, you know, run, they're running against majoritarian democracy. I wrote a whole column about this, looking at Mike Johnson and the Mike Lee stuff. And they think majoritarian democracy is the problem yeah, rather than the solution. And, 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 and I just you cannot overstate how dangerous and extreme that is. Uh, and so that's that alone is, is reason for for us all to 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 roll up the sleeves and get involved in, in our democracy because it's not a spectator sport. Th- this is this is real to me. That radical and extreme side of the thing, because you know I'm 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 for kind of if they're reasonable reforms. This isn't what you know reasonable limits. Like this is what ha- is happening though. No, and and so and for me, here's my one piece of pro bono political advice for you. <laughs> in some ways, Mike Johnson, I think is if if. The district voters can be educated about him might be scarier mm-hmm. than Trump, you know, in New York, well, in New York, you know, because to some of these people that don't take the democracy threat as seriously, which I, I get because they have regular lives and and it's kind of esoteric. Mike Johnson is is a radical, is a Christian radical that wants to be in their sex lives. And I think that that it, is going to be a, a yeah. very dangerous and scary element for for a New York district. It, yeah, and, and 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 you know, if you're voting for a Republican for Congress, you're voting for Mike Johnson. You're voting right. to empower that man and his agenda. And 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 it's not about being a person of faith. I'm a person of faith, but being a person of faith has nothing to do with being a bigot and wanting to sort of uh, you know uh, you know ignore fundamental tenets uh, of our country. Um, uh, you know, you know, like one of the basic tenets of liberal democracy being like, let, let, let's let's keep religion and politics, you know, <laughs> separate. Let's not have our religion drive our politics, um, which is also founding father's wisdom. But but yeah, I, I completely agree with you because you can't separate the two. It just so happens that, you know, of, of the the 18 Republicans who represent districts Biden won, which, you know, that this this was in, in 2020, uh, uh, you know, Lolota was the first one to hug Donald Trump the hardest, you know, putting out statements saying he's a middle finger to New York City. You know, OK, you know, maybe, you know, not not run away from that. You know, unlike Lee Zeldin, he didn't vote to overturn the attack, uh, the, the democracy after the attack on the Capitol or at least Stefanik, you know, other New York City, New York Republicans. But like, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, you don't. He didn't you don't, do it, Liz Cheney or Adam Kinzinger or any of those folks did either. Oh, and God and God bless those folks. That's why we yeah. need to build the broadest possible coalition right now. And 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 I think de- Democrats, you know, I think that's the real opportunity. I remember I interviewed you know, Kinzinger, and he said he hadn't gotten you know uh, outreach from the Biden campaign, and it wasn't that he was you know feeling needy for attention. It was more sort of guys, this is all that we got to build the broadest coalition right now, and and so let's do that. Uh, there's was, no Adam sense. likes getting texts. Win. He might be a little needy. What's Adam, that? Might, Adam, Adam might be a little needy. He likes getting texted. Hi, Adam. Um, <laughs> okay, we got to end with. I got to end with Rudy. I'm sorry. We have to do it. 
Sure. You worked for Rudy right. back right yeah. out of college in, in 2001. Different, different Rudy. So I've, well, I've a, so, yeah, yeah. So let's do that yes. first. I've one, I've one question for you about that time about 9/11. I want to end with that, but let's just do the Rudy sure. of it all first. You saw, sure. like, yeah, you so, saw it up close. Was it, all, was it there? Did you see this? The crazy Rudy? Is it the, is it the Scotch? Is it the power? <laughs> what is it? What happened? So, so let me, let me put all this in in context for folks. Yeah. So, so my actually first, you know, you asked earlier about my origin story, and I, I told you about sort of being a kid and being interested in how yeah. I got interested in politics and history. The first campaign that I really got excited about was Bill Clinton, uh, 1992 and 96. And I, I volunteered on both. And, uh, uh, and I was a subscriber to Blueprint, the DLC magazine. And, 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 and the DLC uh, approach Bring it back. made a, a lot of sense to me, right? And people, Bill Clinton, you know, politically, like Democrats had lost three elections in a row of more, with more than 40 states. And he turned that around. So you're doing, doing something right there. And if you look back in the Clinton Blair politics, that's something I, I, I think we need to take another look at because they actually anticipated a lot of the problems in the declining community that led to the rise of Trump. But that's another podcast for another day. Um, after the 96 campaign, uh, you know, Rudy Giuliani was a pro-choice, pro-immigrant, pro-health care, pro-gay rights Republican. He was basically DLC in an ur- urban context. Um, and, uh, you know, he used to say, uh, to be locked into partisan politics doesn't permit you to think clearly. Um, he clearly stopped thinking clearly. And um, I think it's because he got locked into partisan politics. And it, among other things, it's a cautionary tale about how Donald Trump uh, destroys people's, you know, he leads people to destroy their reputations in the service of a lie. And there's nothing resembling, uh, the, the, you know, to see him destroy his reputation. And, and obviously, the most one of the most pivotal points in my life, and you alluded to it, um, one of the most defining moments in my life was 9-11. Uh, I was there when the towers collapsed. I wrote an essay about it that uh, some people speak kindly of called The Resilient City that recounts what I was doing. But, um, you know, my team and I, I was chief speechwriter in City Hall at the time, and we wrote 343 firefighter eulogies. So you, you want to obsess over Rudy, you know, that that's that's the most formative moment of my life you know the police officer eulogies and and uh and 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 the way that the city and the nation briefly united um in in that unimaginable suffering and why we need to always stand strong against terrorism remember it's always one bad day away from being the number one issue but those moments um that time uh forever defined me in just fundamental ways and what happened to Rudy? I think Donald Trump happened to Rudy. Um, and uh, I, I think it's it's evident with regard to, you know, I mean, the man lit his reputation on fire and had to declare bankruptcy. Um, and, and there's no resemblance. I know. They would have renamed LaGuardia after him if you had just shut up and drank red wine and just did nothing else. It's really, <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Um, I, I do, I want to end with those yeah. eulogies though, because I, I reread sure. that essay this morning, um, before oh. this. Um, yeah. it was, it's what, it's, uh, uh, it's moving. And, um, and I just, I just was hoping you could talk about that. I mean, just that experience and like learning about all those folks' lives and, maybe how that bound you to New York and, and if there's any memories yeah. that stand out from, from that process and learning about all those firefighters. I mean, so many, um, you know, the, the first thing is we were determined normally if a, if, a, if a firefighter in New York dies, the community stops and all of a sudden we'd lost more people in a day than we'd lost in the history. Right. I mean, it was just 343 is unimaginable. The mere fact of the example they set in their death, running into the fire, is the most powerful example of what we do in a democracy, and it should never be forgotten. That real heroism is about thinking about something bigger than your own short-term self-interest. You run towards danger to help people. And the firefighters remind us you don't need to be perfect to be a hero. You just have to do what right, what's right when it matters most. And in writing all those eulogies, you have an appreciation for one of the, the, uh, the, the majesties of democracy, which is that 
we're a nation of foreign by the people and, and everyone's got the capacity uh, to stand up when it matters most and do what's right. And that example then becomes eternal. I learned the importance of, you know, as tragic as it is to leave kids, I think one of the transformative things about having a family is that, that you, you automatically adjust your perspective for something bigger than yourself. And even, you know, I'll never forget Terry Hatton was the captain of the rescue one and his wife, Beth Hatton, uh, was with her when the towers fell. We found out the night of uh, the night before his funeral that she was pregnant oh. and little Terry is, um, is graduating a college about, oh my and, God. um, and, uh, Beth lives in Dix Hills. She, she lives here in, in Suffolk County. And, um, I, you know, th th there's just, when I, I drove by the other day, a fire station out on the South Fork and very subtly, there was a 343, um, outside on a stone uh, tower. And, uh, and my son asked, what's that? You know, and so you start to have those conversations. Um, but I think it's so important to remember the sacrifice and the heroism that day. The fact that we responded as a civil society to evil, that we have that capacity within us. And that while we can't wait for disasters natural or man-made to unite us as a nation, the fact that that's been strained at all, I think speaks to how deep the rot has got. But I still also believe that we can, we have the inherent capacity to unite. There's always more than unites us than divides us as Americans. And um, we need to show that more in our day-to-day -day lives. And that's a way of honoring and respecting uh, those examples, the best examples from American history. And, and to, to echo it in some small way in our own lives. And now I believe directing it towards defending our very democracy itself. Amen, brother. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. John Avalon, uh, he's running New York's first district, johnavalon.com. If you want to learn more or support his efforts, we'll be talking to you. Keep us posted as the campaign goes on, brother. We'll see you soon. Absolutely, brother. And thanks to everything you guys are doing at the Bulwark.